give the Lord a hand. Amen. That was a pretty weak hand. Let's do a little bit better. Much better. Much better. Much better. Um, in, at Easter, we surveyed the congregation and asked, what would you like to hear on sermons? What would you want to hear preached? And we put together five weeks called You Asked For It. And we have five different topics of all weeks. This is the fifth week. This is the one that you ask for, how do I deal with difficult people? People that get under my skin, people that bug me, people that I would like to slap and send to hell. But, <laughs> maybe, maybe not that way. You're, some of you are, you're acting like that. So today is how to deal, the, today is how to deal with difficult people, how to deal with difficult people. But, when we put this together and Pastor Scott Smith came on board, I asked him, I said, I want you to take this this fifth week. I want you to preach it. I want you to give, give the word and, uh, and teach us how to deal with difficult people. So will you welcome Pastor Scott Smith as he comes? Amen. Amen. Are we on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Amen. God bless you guys. It's so awesome to have this opportunity and I thought pastor was going to go and start preaching my message because he br brought up a couple things about dealing with um, uh, ourselves. A lot of times it's ourselves that need to be dealt with instead of the other person, right? But we're going to start today. I'm just excited. I appreciate, how many appreciate this team, the band, the worship team? And uh, we're going to have some fun in just a minute. Um, but uh, I want to just share a couple things about myself so you, and uh, my family so you get an understanding of, uh, you know, not every household is a perfect household. You know, <laughs> how many know some of the best fights and arguments happen on the way to church <laughs> on Sunday morning? You know, <clears throat> it didn't happen this morning in our family, so praise God. Amen. <laughs> But how many know that, I mean, you, it doesn't matter. You can have the best day. You, you know, you're singing, I've got sunshine on, my, on a cloudy day or whatever it is. And you start waking up and you say, praise the Lord. And you look at your spouse and you say, oh, Lord, never mind. But um, you just, it, it's so easy to, to lose joy very quickly. And uh, I, we're, we're going to go through some, some things today. I have 10 different keys um, that will be helpful in us learning how to deal with difficult people. Amen. So, and we're going to get started. The first key today I want to talk about is keeping your cool. Amen. I think we could just stay on this one all day and uh, we would be good. Amen. So keeping your cool, the benefits of keeping your cool, number one, you maintain self-control. You avoid escalation of the problem. Now in Proverbs 25, 28, the Bible says, a person without self-control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. Now that's a good news translation. Other translations say it's like a city with the walls destroyed. So if you lose your cool, guess what? You're not gonna be protected. You've, you don't have any windows, you don't have any doors, you don't have that city wall that fortifies to keep out the enemy. You lose your cool and you drop your guard and the enemy will come in as quick as he, those words get twisted out of your mouth, the enemy will come in so quickly. Let me um, read you something here. <clears throat> the first rule in the face of an unreasonable person is to maintain your composure. The less reactive you are, the more you can use your better judgment to handle that situation. When you feel angry or upset with someone, before you say something you might regret later, take a deep breath, count slowly to 10, and in most circumstances, by the time you reach 10, you'd figure out a better way of communicating that issue. So you can reduce instead of escalate the problem. If you're still upset after counting to 10, Take a time out and revisit after you calm down. How many know <clears throat> that the first time you get confronted by someone and they say something to you that becomes uh, something you didn't want to hear, something you didn't expect, and something that kind of just irritates you, 
your first response is not to keep your cool. Because, you know, we say, you know, I'm a child of God. I shouldn't be treated this way. I deserve to tell you what I feel. Does anybody know what I'm saying? Have you ever done that before? I, I remember a time when I was in, um, I, I played uh, bass guitar for Kenneth Copeland's ministry for about three years. And we were in Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, the band, uh, we were on a break, and actually the whole conference was on a break. So the hotel was filled with people. We ran over as quick as we could to get to the buffet line, and we started having, having our lunch, and there was a lady that got in front of me, and she was demanding that she gets a 50% discount because she was a minister of the gospel. And, and she recognized who I was because, you know, we're dressed in the suits up there and we're on stage for half, half, the, half the night. And, um, you know, and I just, it, it struck me funny. I thought, I'm, I'm going to just listen to this lady. And she just kept going on and on and how she deserved that discount. And I thought, wow, this person is, uh, is not acting in a God, godly way. And here we just came from a great teaching from Brother Kenneth Copeland. And then she turns into this. So as she was doing that, she looked behind and recognized me. And uh, she said, and this person deserves a discount. And I said, no, it's okay. She didn't know that my per diem was already taken care of. <laughs> so I, it didn't matter to me. And so as I'm standing there and she's responding that way, I said, oh, no, no, just charge me whatever. In fact, I pull out a 20 because anytime you go to Kenneth Copeland, you know your money, if you've got money in your pocket, you're going to probably give it to someone. <laughs> and every time I, 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 I went to one of the conferences, it was at least $100 out of my per diem that would go to one of the speakers. You know, so I thought, you know, not that I was trying to teach the lady a lesson, but I wanted to show her what it's like to act like a Christian. So what I did, I said, hey, you know, just charge mine to my room, and here's $20. Just want to bless you. Have a great day. And I just walked off, and she stood there like, how could you do that? How could you let me stand here without helping, helping me out in the situation? You know, so people respond in a weird way when they're confronted. You know, you want to be careful that you don't lose your cool. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't lose your cool. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Now, we're just, we're just beginning, so it, uh, it's going to get more painful as we go. Amen. So I just thought, thought uh, but um, before we do that, you know, I want to, I want to, um, ooh, this mic works. I think we're going to change something a little different here, but I want you to try to guess what, or just tell me another, another way to deal with difficult people. Just shout something out. Anybody got anything? Walk away, smile. Keep your mouth shut. Amen. Well, since you didn't guess it, I think the band, go ahead. Uh, I think the, we're, we're going to help you try to guess the next part. Anybody? Anybody so far? Come on. Okay, here we go. Ready? Say one, two, one, two. I've got to fly. Until I'm free, I fly like an eagle, let like God's spirit carry me. I'm gonna fly like an eagle, because I'm free. I'm gonna fly like an eagle, let like God's spirit carry me. Yeah, yeah. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to tip your ushers. Amen. Fly like an eagle. Amen. Here's some of the benefits of flying like an eagle. You're going to have more peace of mind instead of giving people peace of your mind. I don't think you got that. More peace of mind than giving people peace of mind. You're going to soar above the turbulence. Some people are barely getting off the ground sometimes. Um, you're able to see with a broader perspective. Now, I just want to just share something real quick here as we're talking about fly like an eagle. You know, um, my Native American culture, the eagle, 
is very uh, a prominent, prominent figure. When we were kids growing up, we would always look and to see if we can see the eagles, but it was hard to because they were so far away. They are soaring way above the atmosphere. And, you know, when you learn how they operate, they take all the turbulence that is going on and they start soaring above it. It takes that turbulence in order for them to get lifted into a place where it's smooth sailing. Amen. So I, there's one time my wife and I went to Greece and we were on a ministry tr uh, trip out there. On the way back, we were flying over the Atlantic Ocean, right? There was so much turbulence. It, turbulence doesn't bother me. It's so weird. It doesn't bother me when you know that there's land underneath you. <laughs> but when you're over the Atlantic Ocean, and the, for it seemed like two hours, we were just back and forth, back and forth. It was one of the worst trips. But So what, what did the pilot, they try to get above or find a place where the plane isn't going to do what it was doing. Amen. So in our lives, we need to make sure that as a, some turbulence comes along, that we don't start to uh, lose our cool, that we can say, you know what? I'm going to just take a minute here and I'm going to use this turbulence, this situation to start gaining ground because when you start gaining that airspace, you're looking at things in a whole different perspective. You're able to see the whole playing field instead of just barely able to see the, the end zone, right? So that's an important, important key. Some people uh, in our lives are simply not worth wrestling with. <laughs> Wait, that wasn't even in my notes. How did that do that? Okay. <laughs> Your time is valuable, so unless there's something important at stake, don't waste time by trying to change or convince a person who's negatively entrenched. As the saying goes, you can't fly with eagles while you're hanging out with turkeys. <laughs> Whether you're dealing with a difficult colleague or an annoying relative, be diplomatic when you need to interact with them the rest of the time. Keep a healthy distance. Amen? Amen. Let's go on to point number three. You shift from being reactive to proactive. Amen. Sila. Shift from being proactive to reactive. The benefits. You minimize misinterpretation and misunderstanding. I'm going to say that again. You minimize misinterpretation and misunderstanding. How many know that you can misunderstand what someone says to you because the way you heard it really offended you or really bothered you, and you didn't hear it right because you already were defensive and you are already waiting for something to come at you. All of a sudden, the first thing you're going to do... It, have you ever been in an argument with somebody that someone said yes amen <laughs> have you ever been in an argument with somebody who just is just so crazy it's like and the more you challenge them the crazier they become <laughs> the next one concentrate your energy on problem solving so you're t you're taking that situation you're you're taking your stance from being reactive, you're going to sit back, you're going to keep calm. Now you're going to be able to look at really what the situation is, and you're going to be able to make better decisions. Um, Exodus 14:14 14, 14 says, "The Lord will fight for you. You only need to keep silent and remain calm." Another translation says that you'll only need to keep silent and shut your mouth. <laughs> that is so true, because. As we're dealing with people, we want, if, if we're to be Christ-like, if people are supposed to see that Christ lives and abides in our life, and we're supposed to be a benefit to them to help them grow in their walk, well, we have to be careful what we say, 
We have to be careful what we do, and we have to be careful on how we present our answer to them. Amen? Amen. In my countdown clock is at 1036, so it's still counting down. <laughs> clock, countdown clock. Um, the next one, let's move. Uh, oh, actually, let me, let me share something with you real quick. Um, so when you feel offended by someone's words or deeds, you come up with multiple ways of viewing the situation before reacting. For example, I may be tempted to think that my coworker is ignoring me, Chris, um, or my messages. I'm sorry. Did I, did I say something? <laughs> um, that my coworker is ignoring me or my messages, or is, or <clears throat> I can consider the possibility that she may be busy. You know, I have to say this real quick before I go on. Our ladies of the office here, Pastor Suzette and Sister, Sister Chris, are wonderful to work with. Amen. I'll just move on from there. Um, no, they really are. We, it's like I've, I was telling someone the other day, I said, you know, I, I mean, I go into the office and I think it's just like, do we just laugh all day? Do we just have fun? Is it okay to do that? And we do. It's really, it's really a lot of fun. Uh, hey! No, just, I know it's California, but no. I'm, when, uh, when we avoid personalizing other people's behaviors, we can perceive their expressions more objectively. Widening our perspective on the situation can reduce the possibility of misunderstanding. So, for instance, um, another way we can pers uh, reduce personalization, put ourselves in the difficult person's shoes, you may see a single mother with, uh, with a little boy, and the boy is really disruptive, and, and uh, you know, you may say, you know, what's up with you, kid, you know? Or you could say, man, you know, she's a single parent. It must be difficult to, to have to deal with him at home. And how is he dealing with school? You know, he doesn't have a father. And, and you know, we start putting um, uh, the, the situation into better perspective. So as a person is starting to react in a certain way or do things, we take a minute and just look deeper into their lives. See, it's more about communication and more developing a rapport with people than it is to win an argument. Amen. Because if we just got up every day, I mean, some people, I know they do because I see them on the freeway every day. Some people want to just pick a fight with you every day. There, we, we went out to um, a place, I think it's called Blaze, right? The um, pizza, pizza place in, in uh, downtown uh, Old Town uh, Orange. And um, we went, got, got in the back line, which some, most places you pay first, and then you go sit down and get your food. This place, you have to walk through, order your pizza the way you want it, and then you get to the end. Where there, there was this older gentleman that he was walking the other way, they told him to come through. And all he was doing is talking. And he was so negative the whole time, and just blah, 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 blah. And I thought, man, I'm going to listen to this guy, because this is going to be a good point in the message. <laughs> and... Um, and he went all the way through, and we we're sitting kind of close to where the checkout was. And I heard him raise his voice. He said, so you think I have a problem? And she said, no, I was asking you if there is a problem. Well, see, now you're telling me I have a problem. And he went back and forth and back and forth. And I thought this poor little girl who was trying to keep the peace, she was doing a really good job on trying to bring him down. Then, as he went to sit down, he was just talking just to everybody and um, complaining and just, um, just making a big deal out of, out of nothing. And so I was like, man, I have a piece of hair or something in my... <laughs> but, <clears throat> sorry, that was bugging me. I know it was probably bugging you to see me trying to get that, so I took care of it. Took care of that difficult situation. See, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. That's how we roll. Yeah, it's just whatever's... 
coming out. And just, all right, now I feel at home. You know, I, I am so thankful that, uh, you know, it's a miracle today because uh, Chris, Chris, thank you so much. She was telling me, she said, I don't know how many people are going to be there this is after Christmas or after Thanksgiving. You know, they'd probably be out of town. And I was like, thank you for that encouragement. I, I needed to hear that. So it's a miracle you all are here. But anyway, so, so, and I thought, man, you know, I'm going to go get some to drink. This guy's over there. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to get on his case or anything. I'm going to just walk by and see what he says to me. I walked by and he stopped talking. And he just looked at me and he just kept, kept walking. The next time I walked past him, the same thing. He just, I thought, wow. It's kind of, kind of weird, but I was listening all the time to how he was talking, and I realized that there was something wrong in his brain, and he was, he was just all, he kept spewing out just negative, 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 negative. And how, how do we know that every day people can go to work and be dealing with difficult people who are, who are um, every day, it's like, I hate going into work because my first part of my day is a meeting I have to have with this person and all we do is fight you know before the day even gets going we fight we fight and I hate going into that situation but anyway let's let's move on um, so this is a big one to me this is really the whole whole message um, and I've got six more points after this one but um, this is a really really big point because this is going to save you so much time in your life. And I'm talking about actual minutes and seconds of time that you can be in more peace. You can be in more joy if you decide just to pick your battles. Because there's sometimes it's not worth getting in an argument with someone. It's not worth getting involved in a conversation that is not going to take you anywhere. So the benefits of picking your battle, you're going to save time, energy, and grief. You're going to avoid unnecessary problems and complications. So I want to t tell you the story, and I know most of you know it, and I'm going to just read this real quick. But we all know the story of David and Goliath, right? So when we go into a battle, there should be something in it for us to even go into it. Amen? So what is it worth? For me to spend my time and my energy on dealing with the situation. And if there's no benefit for me, who cares? You know, I, I, I may say something into a situation, but I'm not going to spend the time and energy to lose my joy because it's not even my problem. Amen? So I'm going to read this real quick. But the story about David, you know, and, and Goliath, we all, we all know that. But if you read that whole chapter, the story is really interesting because there's a battle that's going on. You've got the Philistines and the Israelites. And um, it said for 40 days that Goliath would come out and he would just, just torture these people with, with these words. And they're like, you know, can you imagine? It's like this, some of you are saying that's what it is. 40 days, you know, I mean, every day at work or at home, I have a spouse that just harps on me all day long, you know. And, but... This, there was a reason that David got involved in this, and I want to read this for you. First um, Samuel 17, starting with verse 24, says, Have you ever seen anything like this? This man openly and defiantly challenging Israel, the man who kills the giant will have it made. And I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Um, the king will give him a huge reward. Okay, there's a benefit. Just, I would do it just for the money. All right. So there's a huge reward. Offer his daughter. I'm not going to say anything about that. <clears throat> and give his entire family a free ride, or another version says tax-free. And then David, who was talking to the men, standing around. And David was really sent there from Jesse, from his dad, to bring some food, some refreshment to his brothers. So he gets in this circle of these guys are talking and he, I, I believe he overhears what they're saying and so David is like um, say that again so David who was talking to the men standing around him asked what's in it for me one who kills the Philistine and gets rid of this ugly blot on Israel's honor you see David had 
a, a, a plan and a purpose. If someone, you got, you got a single guy that's a shepherd who's out watching the flock, and his brothers are fight, they're, they're servicemen, they're out fighting this battle. You know, Jesse, man, he's, I mean, uh, David, he's, he's going to check it out. And, and, you know, it's like, so, okay, I, I see this thing where it's going to benefit me greatly. I'm going to get some money. I'm going to get the girl. And I'm, my, my family, we're all going to be taken care of. Nothing, we're, we're not going to have need of anything. That was a pretty simple um, decision for him to make. But I believe because of who he was and who he knew himself to be, there was, there was no, no, uh, no second thought of him going into this battle because he, he was confident that what the Lord did for him uh, when he killed the bear and the lion, you know, he wouldn't doubt God at all from stepping into this battle. So there are certain battles that you need to step into. One would be if it, is, if it affects your family, if it affects maybe your finances. How many have ever, you know, gone and swiped your card somewhere and they say, oops, I need to, let me swipe it again. Didn't go, but it actually went twice. And you had just enough money to buy that one thing, you know, but then you're buying it a second time and they're not going to be able to fix it for a couple weeks. It takes, to, you know, you, and then, yeah, okay, we're going to have a conversation. We're going to go into a fight because there's, I, I need to make this right. And it's, that fight is going to be worth the fight. Now, let's go to the next point. Number five, you separate the person from the issue. How, how many times do we know that we see someone come walking by and we're like, oh, I'm going to walk this way to you know, make, make sure I don't run into this person because what happens, you know, you know every time there's something, you're going to have a clash and something is just going to get crazy. And all oh, that person, all he talks about is how depressed he is, how bad he, you know, everything is in his life. And so the benefits of separating the person from the issue, uh, is you establish yourself as a strong problem solver with excellent people skills. Because when you separate yourself um, or separate them from the issue, you're really, you're a great leader because you're able to see, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to really be concerned about this person, but I see there's an issue. Okay. This person has benefit, yes, in our company or whatever, but the issue, you know, I, we can find a way around it to fix this issue. The next one is you win more rapport and cooperation and respect. <clears throat> In every communication situation, there are two elements present. The relationship you have with this person and the issue you are discussing. An effective communicator knows how to separate the person from the issue. You be soft on the person and firm on the issue. For example, let's say you're going up to talk, talk with someone and you say, I, I want to talk to you about what's on your mind, but I can't talk to you while you're yelling at me. Let's sit down together and talk more quietly or take a time out and come back this afternoon. So what you do is you take, if, if, if that situation develops into something that you, there's not going to be a resolution, you're going to just keep going over and over and battling, battling, battling. You need to step away from it for a few minutes and come back to it. <clears throat> another, um, another example. Um, I appreciate you putting a lot of time into this project, but at the same time, I see three of the 10 requirements are still incomplete. And I know Pastor Thomas said that to me a few times. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> I, have, I have a list and I keep, keep working towards, amen. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, um, so let's talk about how to finish the job on schedule. So what you're doing, you see that there are, there's a problem with this person getting this, this, uh, this project finished in time. And so what you do, you have to separate that person and say, hey, man, I appreciate your hard work. I've seen some of the great things you've done, you know, but you're only eight, you're, you're doing three of the 10 and it's due next week. And, 
you know, we need to really, I need to see what, what you need to do to get you to be able to finish on time. And so that way you're pulling the person out of the situation. Another one, uh, my favorite is, now, listen, I really, really want you to come with us, but every time we go somewhere, you're always late. So if you're late the next time, we're going to leave you behind. It's not because we don't like you. It's just because you're late. So, amen. Let's move on to, uh, I'm sorry, the scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So we're not in battle with the person. We pull them away from the situation, and we look at the problem, and we find a way to effectively fix that problem. Next, number six, we put the spotlight on them. How many know? Because they're trying to shine that spotlight right back on you. So the benefits are you're proactive. Number two, you equalize power in communication. Number three, you apply appropriate appropriate pressure to reduce difficult behavior. A lot of people will apply inappropriate pressure to increase the difficult behavior. And how many know that doesn't work? Amen. Um, So a common pattern with difficult people, especially the aggressive types, is that they like to place the attention on you to make you feel uncomfortable or inadequate. Have you ever had someone make you feel just so like, ah, you know, I, I feel just, yeah, of course I can't do it. Not only do I know that you're telling me on top of it that I don't even come close to being able to do it, you're just, you know, stay away from me, please. So typically they, they're quick to point out something's not right with you or the way you do things. The focus is consistently on what's wrong instead of how to solve the problem. So this type of communication is often intended to dominate and control rather than sincerely take care of the issues. If you react by being on the defensive, you simply fall into the trap of being scrutinized, thereby giving the aggressor more power while she or he picks on you with impunity. A simple and powerful way to change this dynamic is to put the spotlight back on them. And the easiest way to do that is to ask questions. So a person may say, um, your, your boss may come to you and say, and just start just dissing you, just totally bringing you down. And you might want to say, okay, well, listen, um, I don't appreciate the way you are talking to me right now. I want you to let me know if you really want me to be here, because I'm going to step back and I'm going to make a decision to see if I really need to be here. Is that something you would like to do is see me here or see me go? So when you bring that question into them, it gives them the opportunity to really think about what they're saying. Because most people, when they are, when they, here's one of the biggest problems people have is there's a saying that says, the lack, your lack of planning doesn't constitute an emergency on my behalf. Okay, so let me say that again. Your lack of planning doesn't constitute an emergency on my part. You know, someone may come up to me and say, Pastor Scott, you know, you need to change the whole set list this morning, you know, because, you know, I just, you know, it it just needs to be done. And I may say, well, why is that? Well, I don't know. You just need, you need to change it. Well, I'm, I'm not going to take on that pressure because I'm not prepared to do that. There's other elements that take place with that. So as people start, start pressing on you for things, it's a lot of times because they didn't plan or they forgot to tell you in due time. If you would have told me last night, I could have made some arrangements to fix it. And so, again, like I said, a lot of people, they will get mad, they'll get upset because they didn't plan the way it should. How many have ever done that? How many of you ever went and planned, you know, you you thought, okay, I'm going to get a hold of all these people. They need to be here at a certain time, and then uh, we're going to have this event. Then 
a week before you call these people and only one of them are available to do anything. You know, you didn't do your part as far as planning, which is communication. You need to communicate with people. So let's, let's, uh, let's continue. And so the, my favorite, which in this is use appropriate humor. Amen. How many know too many of us are, are too focused on the negative so we can't be happy? Amen. So one, one of the benefits is that you disarm unreasonable and difficult behavior when correctly used. Number two, it shows your detachment. And number th- three, <laughs> you avoid being reactive. So when you use humor in dealing with people, which I do a lot. Some, someone asked, well, what did you want to be when you grew up? I said, well, I really wanted to be a worship leader, but I, I know my first calling is to be a comedian. And so my whole life is all about fun and laughter, and then I get to, I get to lead worship. But, um, you know, as we, as, we use, as we use humor, it can disarm people. And it shows, one, that you know, you're not attacking the person. You're able to just say something in fun, say something just to change the mood, the atmosphere. And it's showing that this issue or this problem or even that person, you know, is, you know, these problems just roll off your back. You know, hey, okay, we've got an issue here. We're going to solve it, you know, but let's, let's have some fun while we do it. You know, let's, let's change the way we're going we're gonna to approach this and have some fun while we do it. Amen? All right. So the problems roll off your back. What a great, what a great thing. God, I believe, gives us humor because, you know, for people like me, I see humor in everything. You watch TV. My favorite is, you know, the funny, funny videos, you know, when people will run across the ice and slip and fall. Because I grew up, you have to understand, in, in a Native American culture, we are very stoic people. And if you don't know what the word stoic means, you know, you don't move. And so we, we would get together for a gathering and all the guys would sit in the living room. We'd watch football or something. Nobody says a word. The whole game gets done. We're all done. And we all get up to go. I said, man, that was great. Let's do it again. And we didn't do anything but watch TV. You know, so that's how our communication was. But when we played football or played basketball, someone would, you know, run. My brother one time, he, he, um, he missed a pass and he went head, head first into the bleachers. And he had a concussion and the whole thing. Well, all of us Native American guys were, were like, that was so funny. You should have seen yourself how you, when you hit that thing and you move. You know, it's... To us, we're, it's like, wow, that's kind of crazy humor, you know? But we, we would always, when we would get together the next time, we'd always say, hey, you remember that thing, you know, you did? That was pretty funny. So, and then eight, uh, you change from following to leading. The benefits are you, the leverage direction and flow of communication. Now, um, so, in general, whenever two people are communicating, one is usually doing more leading while the other is doing more following. Have you ever felt like you've just go through life or maybe go through your job and you never seem to be leading, but it's like you're, you always seem to be going somewhere and it's always following somebody? How many have, have ever felt like that? How many feel like you're always leading people and it's like, why don't, why don't someone else lead, lead me? You know, so... There are, there are great, um, pa- one thing I appreciate about Pastor, he's, a, he's an awesome teacher. And since we've been coming to this church, we've learned so much just about things that we've known about all of our lives. But he's brought the gospel and just grace and different topics, different things into our life to where we've grown from that. And as we benefit, I was like, man, you know, they're asking me to, to, to preach and I get to come after pastor does these great sermons, and then, then it's me, and people actually showed up. 
So, you know, it's, it's an honor to be, to be able to be here. But I look at Pastor Tom, I think, man, the years that he's studied, that he's, he's preached, and he, he's known the Word, and he's, he's just uh, engulfed that Word, and just his whole life is about the Word, and is about favor, and grace, and honor. And he's one that I, I look up to as, as a mentor. And, you know, a lot of people that are, that are, are true leaders they don't have to call someone and say, hey, I want to follow you. True leaders will actually follow someone without telling them they're following them. You know, all of a sudden you turn around and say, hey, oh, there's, there's Scott again. What's he doing? He keeps following, following me. I see him everywhere I go, you know. And so, but that's, that's the great thing about uh, when you change from following to leading. Um, in healthy communication, two people would take turns leading and following. However, some people like to take the lead, set a negative tone, and harp on what's wrong over and over. Those kind of people you don't want to get yourself involved with. You can interrupt this behavior by changing the topic. As mentioned earlier, utilize questions to redirect, redirect the conversation. You can also say, by the way, and interject a new conversation or a new subject. When you do, you're taking the lead and you set a more constructive tone. Um, one of the things I just want to share real quick, because I know we're, we're going, uh, time is, is going quickly here, and I want to honor that today. Um, but uh, number nine is, and this is just kind of says for itself, is confront bu bullies. How many know there's always people that are, are going to try to bully you around, that are going to try to say negative things, to you and just try to try to do everything they can to to make your life miserable one of the benefits of confronting bullies is you reduce or eliminate harmful behavior uh, you increase confidence and peace of mind now obviously if you're in a situation where you're being bullied you need to have someone come with you and be um, a guard you know with you if it's at work you know, there's a lot of people who go through so... I, I'm amazed at how, how many people at work sit under fear and intimidation for year after year because their boss, well, that's the boss, he's this way or that way, and they never confront the issue, never confront that their, their life is being so demoted and degraded by this one person that their life just totally is exhausted because they can't find any happiness because what they do you know how many know that what we do in life as a job it really it really helps sets the tone for for our life in general you know we have our families we have our job but if we're not enjoying our job i mean no a lot of times at home it's very difficult because we're not happy especially men we're not if if we don't have a good paying job if we don't have this we don't have that then we're, we're not taking care of our families. And, you know, it's our responsibility as, as husbands to do that. But um, I just encourage you, just talk to a person like Stephanie, who's an HR person, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. How, one way I deal with, with a difficult um, uh, situation, and in fact, I was asked, uh, I don't think it was Stephanie, I think it was Doug and Jim when they interviewed me, um, and, I, and Jim's over the, the prayer ministry. And um, the question was, um, how do you de deal with someone who can't sing? And they want to come, they come to you, and they want to be on the worship team. I, I say, I would just talk to them, and I would say, you know, the Lord is directing me to tell you, you need to join the prayer team. So that's how we, <laughs> that's how I deal with a difficult situation. It's called redirect. And I, and typically if you can start like with a tear, you know, so I really feel the Lord is leading me right now. So, so if the prayer ministry grows, Jim, you know, as a series is you ask for it. So you ask for it. Um, and, and the last thing I want to talk about real quick is, uh, and, and then I want to share something really, really briefly is set consequence. Um, uh, showing that you're proactive and not reactive. Um, you shift the balance of power. 
You win respect and cooperation when appropriately applied. Proverbs 4, 7, uh, it says that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom in all you're getting. Get understanding. Um, when you set consequence, you're giving an actual um, uh, milepost of saying, okay, this is, this is the guideline. This is where we're going for. How many know that as parents, we, set, we try to set boundaries for kids, right? And so um, if we do this, we make it through this, then guess what? We're going to go to Disneyland or wherever it is. So in your life, as you're setting, you make sure you, you really have to set uh, consequence. Otherwise, nothing will ever get done, you know. And families, you know, it, it's... Uh, um, we should have had Thanksgiving after this because I think a lot of times, you know, when we get together with our families, Thanksgiving can be a great time of food, but the fellowship part can be very, very taxing because you're dealing with family members you haven't seen for years. And uh, it's like nobody wants to talk about the situation, but let's just talk about the good food. Amen. And so, but anyway, I, I want to share just in closing this part, I know there was, there's a whole lot uh, I wanted to share, but these are at least um, some, some good points uh, to help uh, get an understanding of how to deal with difficult people. The main thing I would say is you, you got to pick your battles. One, when you pick your battles, make sure that you take that person and just remove them from, from uh, relating them to the issue and then deal with the issue we always respect people. We never, uh, we never um, do anything to, um, to discourage someone. How, how many times have you just argued a point with someone and then you start getting personal and you just get mad, you get frustrated with them. And then when you're done saying what you're, you're saying, you walk away and it's like, I handled that. But God is saying, wow, you really handled that, huh? And so what he wants us to do is, is do everything we can to make sure we, we remain peaceful. And someone told me one time that um, you always praise in public and you correct in private. So when you're dealing with people, you don't, in the middle of a group of people, whether it's work or whether it's your family at home, whatever it might be, you never start degrading someone because of what they did or something that's not done yet, you always want to speak encouragement to them, knowing that there's um, greater things that they can do, that there's so much in them that they're not realizing their potential is not being brought out. Because what happens when you start arguing with a diff difficult person, both your levels are going to go down and you're going to walk away from that conversation totally discouraged, totally destroyed. And just very frustrated. Now, one thing I want to share just in closing here, um, and I'm really proud of Priscilla. Um, over 18 years ago, she received a prophetic word um, about creating children's music. And um, sometimes a dream and a vision takes a long time to happen. Amen. And um, so long story short, we started working on this about a year ago. And um, her and I were working on the songs. We got to the point where we're working on the script, where my son is a graduate from Biola in the film department. He's working for Biola now. And so he's got that expertise as far as the script writing. Priscilla was the creator, and I do all the studio work. Well, how many know that every time we got together uh, in the studio to work on this project, that first thing that happened, we heard just angels singing around us. And no, it didn't happen that way, you know, because each of us in our own are gifted and blessed in different ways. And when we would try to change something on either Priscilla's part or my son's part or my part, then all of a sudden, you know, the sparks would fly in different ways. And then, you know, it was challenging. But we looked at the final and and out of a year of going through all this, you know, challenging, you know, our, our personalities, we're, we're all different people. But what happened 
was we, we knew we kept pressing. We kept pressing because it was going to bless a lot of kids. And not only that, it was tied to a prophetic word. And how many know that prophetic words, you either receive it or you don't. And you either act on it or you don't. And so we actually had them available today. This is, this is, a mer- this is the first time we've had them available. And, um, and so we want, want you to get one, get one for your kids. We know it's Christmas time. It's, it's just an exciting, exciting project that's done. But what I wanted to say about that whole thing is that even though there was some, some, some battles at some time, it was worth it because we knew at the end it was going to minister to people. And uh, in fact, Bobby, um, you know, I think they have what, 12 or 13 kids now. Um, I'm not sure. But Bobby, um, we, Priscilla saw them all come in one Sunday for practice and said, you know, I got, I got to give them one CD to let them check it out. And so Bobby texted me and said, thank you, brother. That's all we listen to now is Leroy and the Talking Rock. And so they came in the next week, and I started singing one of the songs off. And one of the little boys, who's probably three or four, he came up to me and pointed at me. He said, don't. He said, that's from Leroy and the Talking Rock CD. Yeah. I thought, perfect. We've made an impact. But listen, but listen. I know we're getting ready to, uh, to take the offering and, and go into our grow segment. But, and as we do, I want you to really examine your heart. Worship is, is not just lifting our hands. Worship is about opening our heart to the Lord and saying, Lord, if there's anything, David says, create in me a clean heart, Lord. If any of you, and I feel uh, an anointing here to say this, that if any of you here today are dealing with, because it's, I know this is a different kind of message and a different kind of, I, I don't usually teach or preach this way. In fact, it's been over 10 years since I was allowed to preach. And um, it's not because I said anything bad, because worship leaders typically never preach because they're always leading worship. And they get on the stage and other pastors have issues because, hey, they lead worship, they shouldn't preach. So anyway, but, um, you know, I just really feel that, that there's some of you here today that, that you really want to make a decision in your life to change that behavior, because it really is a behavior. We don't have to be uh, uh, ag- aggressive. We don't have to take something and, um, and, and demean someone. We can pull back and sit back. You know, if we only took a second to sit back, to look at the person, look at the situation, and say, Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, because I could be the same way, you know. We all have difficulties communicating with people, but it really, if, if your marriage, if your uh, job is, and your coworkers are important to you in the Lord, then it's, you know, God is gonna do something powerful in your life. So um, just, I'm gonna turn it back to pastor, then we're gonna go back into grow. But I believe during that time, God is gonna speak and minister to you and over your life as we worship and he's going to change your life. How many need something changed in your family or your job situation that your life is going to become better? How many really can say amen to that today? Amen. amen. Pastor. Amen. 